Alrighty, um, so I'll just be taking you through upper respiratory tract infections. Um, if you have any questions, just put it in the chat or I can um, chuck down my email later and you can just email me. Um, so starting off, um, the respiratory tract is split into upper and lower um, with its own immune defenses. So in the upper, you have coughing, saliva, mucociliary clearance, um, your normal flora, and also your tonsils and adenoids, which are lymphoid tissue. Um, and in the lower respiratory tract, you have your mucociliary clearance, um, alveolar macrophages, and um, other lymphoid tissue lining the airways. <clears throat> um, so if any of these go um, whack, um, you get infections. So if specifically for upper respiratory tract infections, um, it can be in the nose. Um, it can be in sinuses, which are these spaces in your facial vertes, um, which are connected to the nasal cavity. And this, um, when these are infected or inflamed, this is called sinusitis. Um, it can spread from a respiratory tract to your ear through this um, structure called the eustachian tube, which I can show you later. Um, and if it gets to the middle ear, it's called otitis media. Um, in the external ear, it's called otitis externa. Um, you can also have infection in the pharyngitis, which is uh, pharynx, which is called pharyngitis, um, larynx, laryngitis. And um, this structure, uh, structure here is the epiglottis, um, which normally closes the airway when you're swallowing um, to stop you from inhaling food. And when this is infected or inflamed, that's called epiglottitis. Okay. So starting off, we have the common cold. Um, and this is just an inflammation of the upper respiratory tract in uh, mucosa um, caused mostly by viruses. Um, it has an incubation period of 12 hours to two days before um, someone presents with a uh, runny nose, um, sneezing, sore throat, etc. cetera. Um, it's a self-limiting um, disease. So you just need to give them symptomatic relief and importantly, no antibiotics. Um, pharyngitis slash tonsillitis. Um, this is mostly again, a viral um, infection. Um, but it can be bacterial. And if it's bacterial, we're really concerned about group A strep, um, which is the most common bacterial cause. And also it has a lot of serious complications, which I'll go through next. Um, the symptoms can present differently, uh, differently in viral and bacterial etiology. So in viral, you have your fever, runny nose, nasal congestion and cough. Various bacterial you have um, enlarged tonsils, um, white pustular lesions on the tonsils, um, and no cough. Um, you can diagnose this clinically. Um, if you're suspecting group A strep, you would also do a throat swab and plate it on blood agar, where, also, where you will see um, beta hemolysis, sorry. Um, and you can also do a rapid antigen detection test um, to test for group A strep. Um, management is symptomatic unless you suspect um, strep pyogenes, in which case you would give penicillin because um, streps are super susceptible to penicillin. Um, yep, yeah, so this is what I was talking about. So it's caused by group A beta hemolytic strep uh, and is also known as strep throat. And um, the complications can be split into suppurative, um, meaning plus producing and non suppurative So um, in suppurative complications, you can have a peritonsillar abscess, which is an abscess next to the tonsils. Um, let me just get the laser up. Okay. So um, it's usually unilateral and it can push um, all the other structures in the throat to the side, but this image doesn't really show, but um, you might see the uvula, which is like usually central being moved to the contralateral side. You can have botitis media. So um, the respiratory tract is connected to the middle ear um, through this um, structure called the eustachian tube. Um, and it can travel up and infect the middle ear. Sinusitis, so it can spread from the nasal cavity to the sinuses um, and mastoiditis. Um, where it can spread up in the same way as it did for otitis media and go to the bone behind the ear, which is called the mastoid bone. Um, you can also have non suppurative complications. Um, so scarlet fever is caused by the toxin that strep uh, produces, and it causes a rash all over the body and also this thing called the strawberry tongue, where um, the tongue is really red and has these um, little bumps on it. Um, acute glomerular nephritis, um, big word, but nephritis just uh, refers to the kidneys. Um, so this is where immune complexes that were made against um, strep deposited in the kidneys, um, and this causes immune cells to come to the kidneys um, and attack it. Um, rheumatic fever. So um, some of the bacterial proteins on strep, um, such as the M protein, are really structurally similar to some proteins we have in our own body. Um, so antibodies made against strep can cross-react with the heart and other tissue and cause symptoms like arthritis or um, inflammation of the heart. Um, rheumatic heart disease is kind of a follow-up from rheumatic fever um, where repeated immune attacks against the heart eventually causes permanent heart valve damage. 
<coughs> diphtheria. Um, so this is caused by um, Karani bacteria diphtheria. <coughs> Sorry. Um, and it uh, kind of invades locally in the tissue of the pharynx and larynx and um, causes necrosis of that tissue. Um, a false membrane eventually forms over the necrosis tissue and this um, whole um, immune like swelling uh, thing can um, swell up so much that it blocks the airway, um, which is why it's a medical emergency. Um, so patients will present with a sign called bull neck, um, which is due to enlarged cervical lymph nodes. Um, you might also see necrotic exudate and um, the false membrane covering the structures in the throat. Um, diagnosed clinically, um, and you would isolate the patient, give them an antitoxin and then antibiotics, and be monitoring them for respiratory compromise. And um, if they go into acute respiratory distress, um, you would give them um, ventilation and um, open up their airway. Um, you can prevent this with a vaccine. Okay, hand, foot, and mouth disease. Um, not so important. It's caused by Coxsackie virus and it causes um, oral ulcers and fluid filled sacs on the hand and feet. Um, and it's highly contagious. Um, glandular fever, um, also known as infected mononucleosis, um, also known as a kissing disease because it's um, transmitted via saliva. Um, it's caused by the Epstein Barr virus, which um, infects B cells and it causes symptoms of fever, sore throat, um, swollen lymph nodes, um, enlarged liver and spleen. Um, you can diagnose it um, a few ways. So um, you can look at a blood smear um, and you can look for um, atypical lymphocytes. So you can see these guys look a little bit funky. <laughs> Um, you can also do something called a monospot test. Um, so this test is just um, looking for the presence of these specific antibodies called heterophile antibodies. Um, these are thought to be made um, because Epstein virus um, infects B cells, um, which are making the antibodies, and is present in 90% of cases of glandular fever. You can also look at uh, serology. Um, important to note is that it can remain latent in B cells and it can become reactivated when your immune um, system is taking a beating. Um, and you can also progress to a type of cancer called Burkitt's lymphoma, although that's pretty rare. Okay, laryngitis, um, infection of the larynx, um, it's mostly viral. Um, it causes common cold symptoms as well as hoarse voice and difficulty or painful swallowing. Um, in management, it's mostly symptomatic. And the most important thing you can do, uh, a patient can do is rest their voice. Um, also known as laryngotracheobronchitis, I think. Um, so it's um, caused by parrot influenza as one, two, three, and it mostly affects kids aged three months to three years. Um, and it's really dangerous because um, little kids have a much narrower airway. So they're in greater danger of airway obstruction if the airway starts to swell. Um, it presents with barking cough, um, stridor, which is like really high, pe uh, high pitched distressed breathing um, and um, increased respiratory effort. So you'll see um, the intercostals like going in every time they breathe. Um, and you might also see that tricky uh, movie. Um, you diagnose it clinically mostly. Um, and for management, you give um, every patient corticosteroids and give them supportive care. Um, and for patients presenting with stridor, you would give them nebulized adrenaline to open up their airway. And in really severe respiratory distress, um, you would maintain their airway through intubation and also give them supplemental oxygen. Um, epiglottitis, epiglottitis, um, another medical emergency, um, and it's caused by Haemophilus influenzae type B. Um, which there is a vaccine for. It will present with the four deeds of um, dyspnea, dysphagia, um, drooling because of the difficulty swallowing, and also dysphonia, um, specifically the sign called hot potato voice, um, which means like a like a muffled voice. Um, you'll also see kids like present um, putting themselves in the tripod position um, where they're sitting down, um, having their ex uh, necks hyperextended, and they might stick out their tongue to maximize their air entry. Um, in diagnosing this, it's really important that you don't attempt to throat culture because that can block their airway. Um, you also just don't want to do anything to upset the patient or um, like take them out of your sight because they can um, go into like respiratory failure pretty um, easily. Um, instead, when you have the time, you would do a blood culture and look at um, their bloods um, for um, white cell count, et cetera. Um, for management, it's really important that you secure airway and then you give IV antibiotics. And um, if it's tolerated, you can give adrenaline and steroids to open up their airway. And again, there's a vaccine for this. Um, sinusitis, 
Um, so it's an infection of the sinuses, which are those um, spaces um, connected to the nasal cavity. Um, it can be infectious or allergic. Um, in infectious cases, it's mostly viral. And it presents with facial pain, pressure or tightness because those spaces are filling up with fluid. Um, you can kind of differentiate viral from bacterial sinusitis by the length of symptoms, um, duration. So bacterial typically lasts more than 10 days. Um, for management, it's mostly symptomatic. So you would give decongestions, pain relief, uh, make sure they're hydrated. Um, and for bacterial, you might give antibiotics. Um, otitis externa. So this is inflammation of the ear canal. Um, uh, there's like kind of three types. So localized, um, it's like this one. Um, so it's inflammation around the hair follicles causing postural, causing postural and furuncles, um, usually caused by staph aureus, um, invasive malignant. Um, it's a bit more serious. So um, the infection can spread from the outer ear to um, adjacent structures and it can cause necrosis. Um, usually caused by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and it's seen in the elderly, diabetic, and immunocompromised. It's a pretty um, serious condition, so you would admit them to the hospital um, as soon as possible, and you treat it with um, ear drops which have anti-pseudomonal antibiotics in them. Um, and lastly, you have swimmers here, um, caused again by Pseudomonas aeruginosa, um, and it presents with like a really red ear canal. Um, you might see also see discharge, uh, discharge from the ear, and it's also treated with um, antibiotic drops. And um, lastly is otitis media. So it's a really common complication of viral respiratory illnesses, um, mostly seen in infants and children because they have a more horizontal eustachian tube, which is the structure that connects the ER to the um, respiratory tract. Um, since um, the eustachian tube is more horizontal, it's more difficult for fluid to drain out of it, um, which can cause stasis and um, colonization by pathogens. Um, it can be viral or bacterial, um, present with upper respiratory tract infect, um, infection symptoms, and then ear pain, um, discharge from the ear, um, tiredness. And if you look at the ear through an otoscope, you might see that the eardrum is bulging or opaque. Um, for treatment, um, just symptomatic, and you can also give antibacterials. Um, some complications, so due to the inflammation, um, a fluid can build up in the middle ear, and has nowhere to go. So um, either the pressure can build up so much that the eardrum bursts. Um, if this happens too many times um, through recurrent infections, this can affect their hearing. Um, otherwise, um, the fluid um, can go backwards into um, deeper structures um, in the head. Um, it can um, accumulate as pus and cause abscesses and other um, further infections. Um, and that's all I have. I think it's on to Alex. That was really great, thank you. And the slides are obviously there for you all to use, which are quite well summarized, they're really good. Thanks, Asini, that was great. Thank you. So now onto asthma and COPD. So the learning objectives for these topics was to mainly know about how, what the mechanisms behind these disease and how this relates to the drugs you choose in treating them, and also what drugs you choose and how they work. So now you might be thinking, why should I care about asthma and COPD? Because, well, generally um, there's usually three to four questions on these topics in the exam that might not seem like much, but last year in semester one, paper one, that's the exam with respiratory questions. There were only eight pharmacology questions. So as you can see, quite high yield. So at the core of asthma, it's an inflammatory disease. It's associated with airway hyperresponsiveness, and it's also got reversible narrowing of the airways. Reversible narrowing is the important part of the condition because that's what sets asthma quite apart from COPD. So um, there's two types of asthma. The, you've got the extrinsic allergic type. That's the most common and typically the one you see in childhood asthma. It involves allergen re-exposure as a, the trigger and it involves inflammatory markers called IgE antibodies and mast cell degranulation. While the other type, intrinsic and non-allergic, while less common is the one you see mostly in adults and it's more severe. It's triggered by the ones like exercise cold and infection. You might have heard of that. And it involves non-specific bronchial hyperreactivity. So airway hyperresponsiveness, what's that? That's basically imbalance between airway contraction and relaxation. You might have heard the word bronchospasm and that's what bronchospasm is referring to in a sense. It's an obstructive condition, both asthma and COPD. They're obstructive conditions, which means that it's hard to exhale due to an 
airflow obstruction as opposed to restrictive diseases where you have decreased storage. And on the investigation, you see this as for asthma, um, the FEV and FVC ratio is less than 80%, but it improves after bronchodilator. Why? Because it's reversible. And also, um, you can detect exacerbations in airway narrowing. Now, in terms of presentation, I won't touch too deep too deeply on this. What the important things to remember is the atopic triad involves asthma, allergic rhinitis, and allergic dermatitis. So any probably with these three conditions tend to kind of happen together in a sense. And well, one of the um, high yield stuff to know is that asthma is associated with nighttime exacerbation. Exact cause is not entirely known, but um, it's one thing to keep, keep in mind. In terms of pathogenesis, um, you can split asthma into four main stages, the induction phase, the inflammation phase, airway remodeling, and smooth muscle changes. These phases are generally like very relate directly to the type of drugs you choose. The first phase induction phase is kind of like the acquisition of the allergy itself. It's quite difficult to prevent. It relates to something known as the Th1, Th2 balance. I won't get into too much detail about it, but what you should know is that in asthma, you got an you, it has an imbalance where you have more Th2 and the body um, triggers an IgE response. IgE response is generally used in the body to fight off parasites and helminths. And as a result, it undergoes what's called a weep and sweep response by increasing vasospasm um, and also increasing the amount of mucus production. And the, the main actors involved in this are interleukin-4, interleukin-5. Interleukin-5 is the one that activates eosinophils. Interleukin-13, eosinophils and mast cells. The next stage is inflammation, where as a result of and interleukin-5, immediate vasodilation, airway edema. This is what preventive medicine targets. And late stage of the inflammation, you have stuff such as interferonic cytokine-mediated cellular, inf cellular infiltration. The next stage is airway remodeling, which is quite difficult re to re re reverse, where the body starts producing goblet cells for increased mucus production. This is where you have um, the actors such as interleukin-4 and interleukin-13 acting, and you get stuff such as basement membrane thickening, which is causes subethelial fibrosis and eosinophils. Then you have smooth muscle changes, which is what control and relieve the medicine targets. It undergoes what's known as smooth muscle hyperplasia and hypertrophy, and as a result, you have increased contraction and more narrowing of the airways itself. The mediators involved in this are histamine and leukotrienes. In terms of the pharmacology as a result, you want to target the reliever. So this is the stuff targeting the smooth muscle hyperplasia is you use stuff known as short acting beta agonists. These are drugs such as salbutamol and albuterol, the selective beta blocker adrenal receptor agonists. They activate sympathetic activation, which relaxes the airways. And the way they work is that they have CAMP, which reduces the calcium cross bridge cycling and thus the contraction of the of the airways themselves. It also inhibits inflammatory markers such as eosinophils and mast cells. Next stage, you have controllers. While relievers are more kind of short-term relief, controllers, well, they do control. They control the disease over a longer period of time. The main drugs here are the long-acting beta agonists, which pretty much work similarly to short-acting beta agonists, but they just work over a long time. Uh, it's important to know that you don't use long acting beta agonists themselves because it leads to increased mortality if it's a salt therapy and it also masks inflammation symptoms. Leukotriene receptor antagonists are another type of controllers. They'll, and also mus muscarinics are also used because, well, muscarinics, they help um, reduce the smooth muscle um, hyperplasia. Leukotrienes promote bronchial constriction, inflammation, and microvascular permeability, and also. Um, mucus secretion. So by blocking this, you stop the stage changes over here, which relates to the last stage. And the controllers are mainly used only for prophylaxis, and they're always used in conjunction with inhaled steroids, because the way you do it is you start with the short acting beta agonist first, mainly salbutamol. That's the first line therapy. Then if that doesn't work, you go to preventers, such as inhaled corticosteroids. Then you change to a combination of an inhaled corticosteroid or leukotriol or, or long-acting beta agonist. If that doesn't work, you increase the dosage. And then if that doesn't work, you move on to special meds. It's a very stepwise progression, which you start small and get bigger. 
And in terms of preventers, which is the one that targets mainly the inflammatory processes, it's glutacol, use glutacol steroids. These increased anti-inflammatory proteins known as annexin A1 and also um, interaction with transcription factors such as NF kappa B decrease pro-inflammatory actions. So as a result, you have antibodies against interleukin-5, which decreases the eosinophilic activation, which is important because asthma eosinophilic. It also has antibodies against IgE, which decreases histamine release, which relates to the smooth muscle hyperplasia and also decreases mast cell activation. There's also a decrease in COX-2 synthesis, which decreases prostaglandins and leukotrings, which are also promoters of the asthma cascade. And the important thing to know about preventers is, well, they prevent the disease. They're not gonna have an acute effect on bronchospasm. So in terms of the drugs you need to know, there's quite a lot. The main ones you only really need to know are the ones that are in bold. One thing to know is that um, they will put salbutamol and salmeterol in the same question because they are going to check if you're going to confuse the two. One way to remember is salbutamol has a B while salmeterol has an M. So B comes before M and as a result, salbutamol is the short acting one. And it's also the first line one. So salbutamol is inhaled. It's five to 15 minute onset and has a three to six hour duration. So that's short. It's exercise asthma protective, but it's not effective against exacerbations. And one of the side effects with salbutamol, which is pretty important to know, is muscle tremor. Salmeterol is the long acting beta agonist. It's inhaled slow onset and works over 12 hours. Ephometerol is another long acting beta agonist. And where it differs from salmeterol is while it's long acting, it has a rapid onset. Ipotropium is a muscarinic antagonist, which is usually used as an adjunct, adjunct therapy. One way to remember the muscarinic antagonist is they end with an M. So muscarinic M. Teotropium is another um, muscarinic antagonist, but this one's long acting. Uh, theophylline. Well, theophylline is one of those special drugs I mentioned. It's a phosphodiesterase inhibitor, which inhibits CAMP and as a result, this um, bronchospasm. It's a bronchodilator with a narrow therapeutic index and it increases beta agonist activity as well. So as a result, this uses adjunct to help improve the beta agonist activity of the other drugs. So one way to remember theophylline is the phylline phosphodiesterase. In terms of preventers, you have the inhaled corticosteroids. The good ones to remember are fluticanazone and budensonide. It's normally used in combination with um, long-acting beta agonists in the third step which generally you pair fluticanazone with salmeterol and budesonide with ephemeterol. The another important um, inhaled cortical steroid is prednisolone, which is mainly used for severe asthma as a last line um, therapy because well, events because it messes up the mineral levels. Oral cortical steroids are mainly used for severe asthma or exacerbation. This um, stuff such as withdrawing, because it's associated with stuff such as withdrawal and Cushing syndrome and side effects include dysphonia. So that's vocal changes or a candidiasis because it's, um, well, it's anti-inflammatory. And also you have local absorption in the mouth, which, which is why when you're told to use inhaled cortical steroids, you need to do a mouthwash. Now onto the other type of drugs, you have Montelukast and Zafirlukast, which are leukotriene receptor antagonists. So that's a pretty easy suffix to remember, leukast, leukotriene antagonist. These are oral, they're good for um, aspirin and exercise induced asthma. Um, they have limited side effects, though they do impair the liver and they're mainly used for prophylactic use. And then you've got the monoclonal antibodies, which is another easy suffix to remember because they're both ending MAB, monoclonal antibody, MAB. So these block the ones that, that are the um, markers of eosinophilic inflammation, IgE, I, interleukin-5. Now, the next um, condition is COPD. Where it differs from asthma is that it's chronic, irreversible progressive disease. And the pathology splits into two different types of COPD. Chronic bronchitis, known as blue boaters, which is the narrowing of airway lumen and increased mucus production, targeting mainly the larger airway, so trachea, bronchi, and bronchios. And then emphysema, which is pink puffers, which is the breakdown of airways terminal to the distal bronchio. So chronic bronchitis is characterized by a decreased VQ and ventilation, where you have cough, wheeze, cyanosis, and also high 
carbon dioxide retention, why emphysema, why it has severe dyspnea, has less cough and it's hypoxic. So that's low oxygen as opposed to high carbon dioxide. So in chronic bronchitis, well, itis, inflammation, you have large airways that have mucus hypersecretion and inflammation, while the smaller airways such as bronchioles uh, become fibrotic, obstructed and inflamed. In emphysema, that targets mainly the airways distant, distal to the terminal, sorry, to the distal bronchial. So those are respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts and alveoli. So the asana cells there have a loss of elastic recoil. The reduced total airway surface for the gas exchange is what causes this low oxygen. And you get what's known as barochest because as there's less recoil, there's more work that the lung needs to do. So there's an increased lung compliance causing either air pocket accumulation, causing you to kind of get the barochest or increased intrathoracic pressure. Now, these two, um, two presentations aren't necessarily split. It's kind of like a spectrum. They can be mixed. And chronic bronchitis in its pathology does lead to alveolar wall breakdown. So you do get some emphysematous changes later on. It's irreversible. So unlike asthma, the FEV FVC ratio is not going to improve from a bronchodilator and it's generally lower, less than 70%. So here's an image basically showing the difference between chronic bronchitis and emphysema. The main thing you want to know here is clubbing has nothing to do with COPD. Um, clubbing is not caused by COPD. So if you see someone with COPD and clubbing, it's due to something else, not due to COPD. In terms of pathogenesis, the main cause that triggers all these changes, smoking. There's also something known as alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which is basically the lungs lack um, alpha-1 antitrypsin protective coating. And that causes the neutrophil elastase to be able to cause damage. And it's important to know because there's also liver damage involved in this case because the alpha-1 antitrypsin is trapped in the liver. And the important part to know here is that COPD is neutrophilic. While asthma is eosinophilic, COPD is neutrophilic. So as, as a result, you have toxic particle inhalation, which triggers this um, neutrophilic pathway, resulting in tissue destruction, releasing mediators, promoting airway inflammation. You can see kind of here in the diagrams, you get stuff where the, um, you have the more mucus secretion here, you've got the mucosal inflammation and fibrosis, that's the chronic obstructive bronchitis. And also you have the disrupted alveolar attachment, which is the emphysema test changes. Now, there's also um, some eosinophilic involvement in COPD, but that relates mainly to exacerbations. You might hear sometimes that people with COPD get occasional flares ups, and this is re related to eos the eosinophilic pathway as opposed to the neutrophilic pathway. And the difference between the two pathways, you can kind of see in this diagram here. So while asthma goes eosinophilic pathway, so you've got stuff such as mast cells, um, CD4 plus cells, so that's TH2 cells and eosinophils. On the other hand, in COPD, you get stuff such as alveolar macrophages, um, the CD8 plus cells, so that's TC1 cells and neutrophils. And yeah, so let's just go over the main changes again. It's narrowing and remodeling of the airways because smoking causes free radicals and reactive oxygen species and activates inflammation. The protease enzyme activation destroys the tissue. That's the alpha-1 antitrypsin response. You also get goblet cell hyperplasia and metaplasia. There's an increased number of these goblet cells that produce mucus, and this is in response to toxins such as smoking. You got bronchiolar injury caused by, um, which has stuff such as bronchospasm, hypersecretion, and the repeat injury and infection kind of cycle leads to a chronic bronchitis, which can eventually lead to alveolar war destruction and emphysema. And because of the um, increased lung vascular resistance due to hypoxia, you eventually develop pulmonary hypertension. And due to the um, emphysema changes, you have elastin breakdown and loss of alveolar integrity, which is the low oxygen changes. So as a result, in terms of pharmacology, well, the main treatment is actually to stop smoking. There's not many good um, treatment options for people with COPD, but the main thing is to stop smoking. Now, the first line treatment is acute relievers, which pretty much the same drugs as asthma. You use um, short-acting beta antagonist, beta agonist, sorry, such as salbutamol, sympathetic opposition to those contractions. Um, salbutamol has muscle trauma, and it's important to note that smoking decreases the effectiveness of salbutamol, which is what you need to stop smoking if you have COPD.
And there's also short-acting muscarinic antagonists, which block the parasympathetic involvement, decreasing contraction in mucus. So you use drugs such as ipratropium, which has side effects of dry mouth, blurred vision, and urinary retention. So some controllers you might use are long-acting muscarinic antagonists and long-acting beta antagonists. But it's important to note that for metero and teotropium combo is an addictive um, combination. So that's something that's not often used because of its addictiveness. Um, in terms of exacerbations, which are eosinophilic in nature, you use the inhaled oral steroids, which are, well, the, um, the, those were the preventers I talked about, which reduces eosinophilic inflammation. And they come with a withdrawal risk and cushionoid syndrome, which the injury, um, diagram I showed earlier on. But they're also not very effective against neutrophilic inf um, inflammation in COPD, which is why they're only really used for exacerbations. In, for moderate severe COPD, you upgrade to a triple therapy. So there's long-acting beta agonists, long-acting muscarinic antagonists, and inhaled corticosteroids. And of course, they have the... Um, steroid side effects of dysphonia and oral candidiasis. There's also surgery and um, oxygen therapy, but they're generally not used because they're quite restrictive for the patient themselves. Yep. Thanks so much, Alex. That was really great. Um, yeah, that was fantastic. It was a great summary of everything. Um, so before I, we had a presentation summarizing the clinical presentations, but I think I'll do the immunology now because it follows quite nicely after Alex's and Sassini's. So I'll just share my screen and try to open the right tab. So good morning, everybody. Um, today, I'm going to be talking to you about immunology, which is, to be honest with you, it isn't as high yield as the other two presentations today, but it does kind of really support your learning of those presentations as well. Immunology will be asked sometimes in microbiology and immunology can be asked in pharmacology as well. So it is good to have an understanding of it. Um, I'll go through relatively quickly. I'll try and show you the high yield elements. So as you can imagine, the respiratory system is really important in regards to the progression and prevention of disease. This is because you're breathing in particles almost every day, almost all the time, constantly breathing in particles, irritants, pathogens, everything like that. And so your body has a couple of systems or defenses in order to cope with that. The first and most important we're gonna talk about today is the innate immune system. So the innate immune system consists of um, a variety of factors. One is the physical barrier of epithelium themselves. Because you have cells existing in the epithelial wall, pathogens can't just seep into your bloodstream and then flow around the body and cause infection. So the physical barrier of, epithe of epithelium is really important. The second um, really system that's used is called the mucociliary transport system. And the way this works primarily is that goblet cells are your mucus secreting cells. They will secrete mucus, which will tap pathogens and irritants. Then cilia, which are like hair-like cells, kind of undulate or beat rhythmically um, to move those pathogens and irritants and everything contained in the mucus up through the trachea and then into your esophagus for you to swallow. And there they're broken down by the stomach acid in the stomach. Um, in regards to what can cause illness, you need some defect in the system. So often if you have a defect in your mucociliary system, either your mucus isn't trapping the bacteria, your mucus is very thick and defective, or your ciliary are not beating, people become susceptible to infection. A significant irritant to the mucociliary transport is smoking, and it's probably the most important risk factor for these respiratory diseases. But as you can imagine, bacteria and viral infections, which cause damage to your epithelium and ciliary, um, are important as well. Some pathogens, part of their pathogenesis is to attack the mucociliary transport by secreting toxins, such as the cili ciliostatic substances. Other mechanisms to prevent against illness are, for example, your coughing reflex, which will allow you to cough out pathogens as well. It is important to recognize that epithelial immunity, or when I talk about epithelium, it isn't only a physical membrane or a physical barrier. There is a degree of specificity and sensitivity in your innate immune system. This is brought together by your pattern recognition receptors. Um, Toll-like receptors are a subset of pattern recognition receptors that initiate immune responses. As you can see here, all your epithelial cells 
have, or well, not all of them, but um, most of your epithelial cells do have toll-like receptors that will interact with foreign substances. So for example, there aren't really many cells besides, your, besides sperm in the body that contain flagellin. So if your epithelium cell is interacting with the, whatever, with any substance that contains flagellin, it's probably bacteria, it's probably pathogenic. So the interaction of these substances is gonna initiate an immune response. An immune, immune response is initiated by the secretion of chemokines and cytokines that recruit Im immune cells and promote inflammation by making endothelial cells activated, promote leakiness of the endothelial cells and allow protein and edema to go to the areas they're needed. Furthermore, you have some antimicrobial agents, which are like little, little proteins that destroy pathogens directly. Defensin is a good example of this. As you can imagine, if you have a cell over here, your chemo, and this is your endothelium over here, your cytokines are secreted in this area to activate your endothelium to um, display integrins and uh, integrins to recruit your leukocytes into these areas. If you're concerned about pathogens and you want to secrete antimicrobial agents, you'd secrete them in the trachea or the airways where the pathogens circulate. That is beautiful. Great. So the immune system and the epithelium, again, have quite a dynamic interrelation. The immune system or the cytokine release called interleukin-22 promotes epithelial proliferation with the intention to have a greater integrity to the epithelial membrane. Bolt or bronchos associated lymphoid tissue is sort of a discrete area of immune cells, kind of like a lymph node. And often a lot of the immune system's interactions with the pathogens occur there and an immune response is mounted. So Th17 cells, which are a type of T cell or Bolt itself secrete interleukin-22. The lamina propria is an area um, really that contains a lot of immune cells. So plasma cells, effector cells, macrophages, mast cells, really innate and adaptive immune systems. If you look here, you can see you have your mucus being secreted by your goblet cells in the epithelium. These are anchored to a basement membrane. Under your basement membrane, you have your lamina propria where your immune cells are circulating. Um, as in addition to the immune cells just circulating freely, you also have these lymphoid follicles. Now this lymphoid follicle is called a bolt. M cells in the epithelium can display antigens to go down here and dendritic cells or antigens themselves can just be displayed to these lymphoid follicles. They can interact with T cells and immune response can be mounted in the adaptive arm of the immune system. This is quite significant as you can imagine. It's a similar, similar mechanism to lymph nodes. So again, they acquire antigens from the respiratory tract and facilitate and initiate immune response. And very importantly, they do consist of memory. And the benefit, I guess, and why you don't just need lymph nodes is these are quite local to the site. So you can have a readily mounted immune response. This is just showing you the pathogenesis of, so respiratory tract infections, um, you have your defenses of mucociliary clearance, Often pathogens, not often, but some pathogens can evade them through secreting ciliostatic, ciliostatic toxins such as pertussis. Other pathogens or bacteria such as TB can kind of infiltrate your macrophages. They can resist the phagolysosome complex and continue to exist. So the only way, really the way pathogenesis occurs is through a defect or an attack on the immune system. Some examples of viruses that affect the immune system are the adenovirus, don't need to worry about that. Rhinovirus is impossible for upper respiratory tract infections, especially your common cold. Influenza viruses interacting with your hemoglobin to infiltrate epithelial cells. And RSV, which can cause bronchiolitis and pneumonia, so it affects a bit lower in the respiratory tract. Pneumonia is often caused by an exudate or a collection of inflammatory cells in the alveoli, which make gas exchange difficult to occur, so you can't breathe quite as well. RSV is important in infants when you think about it. It's a very important cause of bronchiolitis and pneumonia in infants. So if you hear RSV, think infants. Um, this is just an image of your influenza virus attaching to ciliated epithelium and infiltrating it through, um, adhesing to hemoglycin, hemoglycin and infiltrating the cell, then releasing its proteins creating more viral particles and then expanding and infiltrating further adjacent cells. 
Here you can see the cilia, they're these little microtubules over here, and here you can see these little viral particles. I hope you can see my mouse. Um, we kind of talked about how influenza works with hemagglutinin and, and attachment and endocytosis, pertussis in regards to the toxins and tuberculosis in regards to the resistant of phagocytosis and the macrophage. Um, an important concept to understand is the concept of superimposed infections. So if you have an ongoing infection in the respiratory system, often maybe a viral infection, you're going to have damage to your epithelial cells and to your cilia. That means your intrinsic defenses will be affected. And so you're more susceptible to further infections. So often a viral infection will be followed by a bacterial infection. Um, this mechanism underlies many risk factors to the disease. So for example, if you have influenza, you're probably more likely to get a superimposed bacterial infection. Um, just if we think about everything we've spoken about, how important the immune system is, obviously, if you're immunocompromised, you're more susceptible to a wider variety of infectious organisms. So organisms that are obviously just normal, not obviously, but infections that are not just normally flora in your cell that your immune system can deal with quite well through their mucociliary clearance and innate immune response. Um, in immunocompromised people, these systems might not be as effective, and so they're more susceptible to infections such as pneumocystis durovecci and aspergillus, which people with um, immunocompetent people really don't get much, and these are characteristic of AIDS. Macrophages in the lung, it's pretty low yield. You have two types of macrophages, interstitial macrophages, which occur if the epithelial barrier or alveolar barrier is breached, alveolar macrophages that have a lot of work. They um, all inhaled substances reach them. They respond to injury of the pneumocytes and initiate an immune reaction. They also remove debris and can stimulate fibrosis in the healing response, but that can be damaging as well because you want kind of, you don't want fibrotic lungs, which you don't need to worry about. Innate, we've spoken about pattern recognition receptors and toll-like receptors. These are just some more images showing you how um, a bacteria has interacted with the pathogen. It's toll-like receptor has initiated cytokine and chemokine release, which has activated endothelium, protein fluids being released and extra viscation of the neutrophils. Um, so neutrophils are pretty important in inflammation. As Alex mentioned, eosinophils are more important in asthma, but in bacterial infections, neutrophils are more important. In non-infectious states, neutrophils just circulate around the bloodstream. In infectious states, macrophages, when reacting with antigens, will release cytokines and chemokines that will, chemokines that will attract neutrophils in the tissue. This will lead to fluid collection. Um, so you can see here, this is an image of a lung that has had really, it's been consolidated with neutrophils. So the blood vessels have become leaky. They've led to a lot of protein, white blood cells, and fluid collecting. And as a result, that's lead, led to an inflammatory exudate which has caused the consolidation or solidification of the pulmonary tissue. Dendritic cells are important antigen presenting cells that interact with naive T cells and initiate an immune response. Um, you know, that's essentially all you need to know. Um, M cells also are important in presenting antigens from the bronchial lumen to bolt. Yeah, I think you're pretty familiar with dendritic cells. They're just antigen presenting cells. Um, another important thing to know is T cells can differentiate into different sorts of cells and the interleukins that are secreted really determine this and they determine what cells will predominate in the inflammatory response. Furthermore, T cell cytokines determine the antibody or serotype switching of B cells. So IgE is the principal immunoglobulin involved in immediate hypersensitivity reactions or ATP um, or really in, yeah, in your, these asthma reactions. So if individuals have high serum IgE levels, more interleukin-4 producing Th2 cells, you can see over here, interleukin-4 producing Th2 cells, they're more likely to have an eosinophilic reaction and more likely to have allergy. IgE will initially attach to mast cells and when it's stimulated again, will release histamine protease of prostaglandins, leukotrienes, all these inflammatory mediators. Um, serotyping occurs as well for IgA. IgA is predominant in the mucosa and secretory IDA, and it also um, exists in serum. Really important to know is secretory IgA is non-inflammatory. The reason it's not inflammatory is in, your, um, in these regions, you have a lot of flora and you don't want to mount an immune response against the flora because you'll have a lot of harm from that inflammation unnecessarily. And it'll just also you require your flora for that innate um, protection as a competitive with more pathogenic substances. These are just an image of secretory and serum IgA. 
strangely high yield. Um, mentions respiratory allergic disease, you have allergic rhinitis and asthma. Um, really, this was kind of discussed by Alex, but on first exposure, your dendritic cells will drive Th2 differentiation. Th2 cells will release cytokines that stimulate B cells to produce IgE. And this is due to the interleukin-4 cytokine mainly. IgE will bind to FC receptor and mast cells and just stay there. Then if there's another exposure to that antigen, that mast cell will degranulate. Um, yep, there's an acute and chronic response in allergy. The acute response is driven by histamine leukotrienes and other inflammatory mediators. The chronic response is more cellularly driven and driven by cytokines. Um, we'll discuss this. What's really important is the dendritic cells stimulating these T cells will determine whether there's an allergic response or not. So if your dendritic cell simulates the CD4 cell, releasing interleukin-4 and interleukin-5, you'll have Th2 cells predominating or T cells, and these will release IgE and activate mast cells, whereas a dendritic cell can also produce T regulatory with immunosuppressant cytokines like interleukin-10 and TGF-beta, which will suppress an immune response, even though the same antigen is interacting with the dendritic cell. These will just lead to a release of IgG. Um, second last slide, you can see the pathology of asthma leads to cell permeability. So there's a buildup of fluid due to that inflammation, lots of goblet secretion with mucus due to that inflammation, difficulty breathing because your smooth muscles contracted, so your airway is smaller with that bronchoconstriction. Um, this is just an image of a really inflamed airway in asthma. This is a normal one. This is called the carina. Um, in this histological image, you can see excess mucus. The excess mucus clogs the airways, contributes to wheezing, and loss of lung elasticity makes it harder to breathe in. Um, recruitment of inflammatory eosinophils, you can see them collecting here, is mediated by the Th2 response. A way to treat um, is something called allergen immunotherapy. You incrementally inject subcutaneously an allergen to increase immunological tolerance, and you increase the dose as you go on. This slowly increases as you have more exposure to this antigen, there's a more prioritized T regulatory response than a Th2 response. And so allergy, that's an immunotherapy for allergy. Th1, Th2 ratios we'll discuss next year, but Th1, the more Th1 you have, the less Th2 you have. So um, you have a reduced allergic response. So I'm just gonna text your chat to come now. I hope that was helpful with any questions. Not all good. Getting keen for your scavenger hunt. Um, so your jet's coming soon. Right now. So it won't be too long. Actually, I'm quickly gonna call him. that will be a second. Um, so yeah, Jack's gonna present to you about really the main clinical conditions of the respiratory system. And he's also gonna tell you the clinical reasoning behind, behind it as well. Then we have a couple of slides from Yufe at the end about IBM. So it should be good. Hey, Ajay. Hey, um, I'm just setting up my mic. Oh, good. Do you have the link you... to the slides or should I send them to you? Yeah, I got them up, that's all good. Yes. Um, can you hear me fine? Yeah, yeah. All right, sweet. Okay. Um, okay. 
right slide. Yep, looks good. All right, sweet. Okay, um, hey everyone, today we'll be talking about clinical reasoning in, in the respiratory system. So we'll just be walking through a bunch of the major conditions going from high yield to low yield um, and what you look for on examination, a bit about the pathophys and so on. So we'll be starting off with asthma and COPD, the two main um, conditions you wanna know about. So asthma is essentially an inflammatory uh, condition where your bronchioles and your um, bronchi so I have a bronchospasm because of an allergen um, mediated by TH2 and all these other uh, inflammatory mediators. But essentially you get this hyper-responsiveness of airways, which causes bronchoconstriction. But about the pathophys, it's like most of your inflammatory conditions. So there's, there's a bit of remodeling. Uh, so the three main things you wanna know are there's fibrosis of the basal membrane, also known as thickening. Um, there's increased smooth muscle or hypertrophy, which would cause the narrowing of the lumen. And there's uh, increased mucus production or increased uh, goblet cells, which also further narrows that lumen. Um, so there's a few stages of how asthma actually comes to be, um, which you should know about. So the first thing is actually the allergen being introduced in the system known as induction, which then leads to inflammation. And like your other inflammatory conditions, which you might talk about in immunology later on, that's mediated by TH2 which leads to eosinophils and mast cells to infiltrate that uh, region of, uh, uh, of smooth muscle and cause, that, uh, cause these inflammatory changes. So then you have your airway remodeling, which is primarily hypertrophy of smooth muscle. And then um, the smooth muscle actually constricts in stage four, which is mediated by all these different uh, inflammatory mediators, histamines, leukotrienes, and all. Uh, that is going back. Okay. So on history, you would probably hear a bunch of triggers. So the main triggers of an asthma attack are usually the cold air or exercise. Certain environmental triggers may also exacerbate it. Um, and there's a bunch of different triggers, but these are the main ones you want to know about. Um, and then there's certain drugs um, that also exacerbate asthma through their different mechanisms. So NSAIDs, with their arachidonic acid pathway, increased leukotrienes, which causes, uh, which can cause um, a worsening of asthma. ACE inhibitors, if you remember from your antihypertensives from last year, increased bradykinin, so they might come in with a dry cough, which as you can imagine would also exacerbate asthma and you might switch them to an ARB instead. Uh, and beta blockers are always contraindicated in asthma because uh, they cause bronchoconstriction. On, on um, examination, um, you might see these signs and symptoms. So signs and symptoms are hard for the respiratory system, I feel, because they all sort of have very similar symptom, um, presentations. So you kind of want to focus on the buzzwords that faculty would like to um, test you on. So of course, you're going to have shortness of breath. You're going to have a bit of tachycardia and chest tightness, but that's common to a lot of respiratory conditions. So what you're really looking for is an expiratory wheeze. So if you hear a wheeze like sound on expiration when you're auscultating, that's called a wheeze. And if it's on inspiration, it's called a stridor. So on asthma, you're looking for one on expiration and a non-productive cough. I'm pretty sure it's worse at night, which might be because of the temperature, like it's colder. But um, yeah, so non-productive cough worse at night. Now you've got your atopic triad, um, which you also want to look on history. If, if your patients present with uh, these three conditions as well as a background history that puts them at a further risk of asthma. So you've got your eczema or dermatitis, uh, your allergic rhinitis, and your asthma is the third one. And then there's this niche sign, which uh, I think they like to test in clinical scales called pulses paradoxes. And essentially all it is, is if we're measuring blood pressure in someone with, with asthma, when they're taking a breath in, so during inspiration, there'll be a marked drop in systolic blood pressure. So your systolic blood pressure, your 120, 130, that'll drop, I think, by more than 10 uh, millimeters of mercury. Um, so that's called pulses paradoxes, very common in young asthmatic patients. Uh, investigations. So if you remember, asthma is an obstructive condition. So you, you wanna look at your spirometry and in obstructive conditions in spirometry, your FEV1 over FEC is decreased or below 80%. And that um, the difference is, so your main two obstructive conditions are asthma and COPD and how you differentiate them on spirometry is you do the spirometry and then you administer a bronchodilator. So you're 
Saba, um, your Ventolin puffer. And asthma will improve with the bronchodilator when you do your second round of spirometry by either 200 milliliters or 12% increase in uh, FEV, FEV1. So if you do the same thing in COPD, it won't improve because that's irreversible. But on asthma, oh my gosh, <laughs> sorry, let's go back. On asthma, it will improve. And then your uh, expiratory flow rate, um, isn't used as much, but you use the peak flow meter, which is measuring um, the speed or how fast your expiration is. And that's more useful for um, very acute exacerbations of asthma. All right, COB, COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Essentially, it is, uh, it's chronic, so it's over a long period of time and progressive. So you see it in older patients mainly, and it's composed of these two different pathologies. So one is chronic bronchitis, which um, is excessive mucus production and narrowing of your lumen. So you have this um, chronic productive cough. And then there's emphysema, which is because of these uh, pollutants and toxins, most commonly smoking, your air spaces or your alveoli break down the elastin of the walls and they sort of um, almost merge together and your, your, your surface area to volume ratio is just not, is just terrible in emphysema. So um, you're not getting enough oxygenation of the lungs. And they also get hyperinflated because elastin is what does the recoil of the lungs. And so when elastin breaks down, there's decreased passive recoil. So your lungs are over expanded. Um, and you can see that on chest x-ray with a flattened diaphragm. So normally your diaphragm is uh, a lot more curved. Um, and because your lungs hyperinflate, um, they get pushed down. And so your diaphragm at the bottom of your lungs will be flattened. A uh, bit of pathophysiology, not much, but essentially, um, yeah, you've got your toxins, primarily smoking, but also some workplace exposures cause this chronic inflammatory response in the lungs. And note that it's not an allergic inflammatory response. So you don't get eosinophils. Um, I think it's mainly neutrophils, um, but I'll have to check that. And you get a lot of the similar changes in your airway structure. So they get narrower, you get more goblet cell hypertrophy, which leads to more mucus and thus the chronic bronchitis. And your ventilation perfusion ratio is decreased because your, your vessels constrict, your pulmonary vessels constrict. So there's less um, perfusion. And that also leads to pulmonary hypertension, which can lead to cardiac issues later down the line. So yeah, risk factors for COPD, you've got your modifiable, your non-modifiable. So smoking is your major modifiable risk factor and a huge proportion of COPD patients are smokers. Um, and then your non-modifiable age. So naturally, as you age, you lose your FEV1. So that would bring down your ratio. It's more obstructive. And then genetic factors, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency. There's a whole bunch of biochemical pathophysiology there, which um, might be worth just skimming over but it's not that important for clinical reasoning. Um, okay, physical findings. You see, again, there's a lot of similar uh, clinical findings in COPD as will be with other respiratory conditions. You've got your chronic cough though, which is important, um, especially in the morning, because it's chronic, right? So it's always gonna be there, um, but yeah, in the morning. And some of the more important ones, so you use your intercostal muscles because um, it's harder to breathe and there's hyperinflation. Um, Positive Hoover sign, again, just one of the signs you need to know. So what it is essentially is normally your lungs uh, on inspiration, they're expanding. So your ribs go outwards and laterally. Um, but because in COPD, your, your lungs are so hyperinflated that your, your bottom ribs actually go inwards. And that's Hoover sign. It's, it can be really hard to see in person, but if they do test you in exams, they would give you a description. Uh, but yeah. Barrel chest, um, hyperresonant lungs. These all sort of make sense when you think of the, the pathophys. Um, and the main thing is that there's air trapping in the lungs, so they get hyper uh, inflated. Investigations, again, irreversible decrease in your FEV1, FEC ratio. Um, yeah. A right, pneumothorax. So, pneumothorax um, is sort of a lung collapse of sorts. And it happens when your pleural cavity, so your visceral and your parietal pleura, they're normally stuck together with a bit of uh, surfactant or liquid in the middle. When air enters into the pleural cavity, mainly because of penetrative wound or just, um, it can be caused by a few different things, but in a trauma situation, 
uh, air enters the pleural cavity and thus your air uh, lung collapses. And then um, a very specific type of pneumothorax, which is the main one faculty likes to test is a tension pneumothorax. And so what happens is the penetrating wound actually leaves a flap of um, like air is unable to leave. There's this one way valve. So air comes in um, to the pleural cavity, but then the, the, the wound closes almost and air can escape. It's, it's very specific how it works, but all you need to know is that it's a one way valve. And so atmospheric pressure is less than your uh, in pleural pressure. And so air keeps rushing into the, into the pleural cavity and that worsens your pneumothorax and it can constantly get small, your lung collapses uh, consistently. Um, yeah, so you've got your increased intrapleural pressure because there's more air in a really constricted space. And so, yeah, your alveolar collapse and you have your decreased uh, ventilation perfusion ratio. So one of the telltale signs of pneumothorax is tracheal deviation. So in a tension pneumo, it would be away from the side where um, your, your lung or your pleural cavity has been compromised, it would go to the other side. And it's actually a whole mediastinal shift because of the differences in pressure. So you might even see the heart and other structures deviate to the opposite side, uh, which can cause a bunch of problems. But overall, these are the main conditions. And I think you kind of just have to go through them and sort of wrote, learn them. But uh, I couldn't find a way to, to understand why it happens in each way. But Essentially, you're, you have your atelectasis or your lung collapse and your fibrosis, which uh, your trachea goes towards the, the, the side of the, the lesion and the fib fibrosis, there's a reason here. And away is mainly your pneumothorax and your PE and also some uh, certain cancers or a thyroid goiter or something might cause your trachea to deviate as well. All right. Okay, P pleural effusion. So, in a pneumothorax, there was air in the pleural cavity. In a pleural effusion, there's fluid. Um, and you see it um, diagnostically on a chest X-ray, you see this meniscus sign. Um, but essentially, there's a bunch of different risk factors for why it can happen. Um, and most of them have to do with increased fluid um, in your body. And it's sort of almost like an edema of sorts. Um, because that increased fluid sort of leaks out into the pleural cavity. So it can be associated with things like, um, yeah, pneumonia or uh, kidney failure, which would cause an increase in fluid, but then a bunch of different conditions, autoimmune diseases, um, asbestos um, and PEs. Um, on clinical signs and symptoms, again, you have very similar signs. You've got your cough, you've got your pleuritic chest pain, cyanosis, because you're not getting enough oxygenation. The big, big buzzword that you'll hear is stony dull percussion. If your lungs are filled with air when you're percussing the lungs, it would you're expecting resonance everywhere. And then you get to this bottom border of one of the lungs and it gets stony and dull, whatever that means. <laughs> um, you have decreased breath sounds because there's no air going to this uh, huge portion of where you expect lung. You go your meniscus sign on your um, chest x-ray, which is just this um, over here. Now, do I talk about cost of deferment? Yep, okay. So on chest x-ray, you'll also see this blunting of the cost of phrenic angles or cost of deframatic angles. And that's a big diagnostic factor. So this is obviously a massive effusion. But if you think about, okay, costo, diaphragmatic. So costo means your ribs and diaphragm or phrenic is your diaphragm at the bottom. So the point where your ribs and your diaphragm meet in this corner, there should be a very sharp point of sorts going down. Now, even this is a little blunted. So even this, you could describe as blunting of the costophrenic angle, which is diagnostic for PE. I mean, not PE, pleural effusion. Um, on, on, on the left lung hair, obviously it's a lot more, it's a lot bigger of an effusion. So it's a lot more obvious, but even if this diaphragm is like, say it's flat hair and you don't get this inward point, that would still be a pleural effusion because the only thing that can cause that is fluid buildup in between the, the pleural. Um, and your pleural tap or your pleural ultrasound can also detect fluid and pleural tap, I believe, is the management for an effusion. Right, on the other hand, the other PE, but yeah, PE means pulmonary embolism. So embolus is essentially a piece you have, if you have a thrombus somewhere in the body and one of a bit of that thrombus breaks off and travels through the bloodstream and it lodges in the lung, it would be called a pulmonary embolism. 
um, most commonly originates in your deep lower limb veins. So you're thinking your calf uh, or your thigh veins, mainly a DVT would be in your calf. And so if you think about your anatomy again, your, the veins in your lower limb are going straight up, joining into the IVC, into the right side of the heart, right atrium, right ventricle, and then out to the lungs. So all of all the veins uh, in that pathway are pretty large and the embolus wouldn't get trapped until it reaches the pulmonary vasculature and the capillaries there where it can lodge and then it would be considered a PE. Now, risk factors are mainly, so you've got your Verkhaus triad. Now you'll talk a lot about this in hematology next semester, but it's still important now. Uh, it's just mainly these three um, situations or um, yeah, conditions where your blood is more likely to clot and thus lead to higher risk of any emboli forming. So one is hypercoagulability, um, which is your blood is more likely to clot um, either because of drugs. So the main example would be your uh, oral contraceptive pill or even during pregnancy, your blood is more likely to clot. Second is stasis. So either post-surgery, during surgery, your body is still for a long time and stasis is just horrible for any um, physiology of the, the body. So if you are either post-surgery, on a flight, on a long drive, those are your main buzzwords. You're, if you see that on an exam, you're immediately thinking PE. And endothelial damage um, is essentially trauma or more chronic endothelial damage or atherosclerosis um, or surgery. So if you, surgery almost, uh, surgery is, is someone who's just had a recent surgery uh, completes all three of these criteria and so are very high risk of PE. So someone on the wards will almost always be on a blood thinner or a dog of sorts. Um, yeah, I think we pretty much talked about the path of fizz. Um, you'll see a VQ mismatch uh, because as you can imagine, there's a blood clot disrupting the vasculature. And so there'll be parts of the lung where air is still getting in so your ventilation is still fine, but your the blood isn't getting to that part of the lung, so the perfusion uh, would be decreased. Clinical signs and symptoms, again, dyspnea, onset of pleuritic chest pain, very vague symptoms, but so you really want to focus on your history in this. So if they have a history of calf pain, if you're examining someone, you want to squeeze their calves, um, and if they would, they would have excruciating pain if they had a DVT calf swelling, red calves, but mainly a history of travel, a history of surgery are your two main um, red flags that you're thinking of in a PE. So yeah, I talked about the VQ scan for investigations. You can do angiography, pulmonary angiography to detect where exactly the clot is. You can do a chest x-ray. Often, again, because it's vague symptoms, you do a chest x-ray to rule out other causes of the dyspnea and the pleuritic chest pain because there's a million causes of that. And D-dimer is an inflammatory marker. If I remember correctly, it can only be used to rule out a PE. So if it's normal, then a PE most likely isn't happening, but it can't be used to rule in because there's a bunch of different things that can raise your D-dimer. But yeah, you'll talk about that in hematology mainly. Cystic fibrosis, systemic um, autosomal recessive disorder. It affects a bunch of different organs, your lungs, your pancreas, your reproductive system. So we'll be focusing on the respiratory context here. Um, yeah, again, there's biochemical reasons why it, it develops. You've got your chloride transportation disruption, sodium salt <laughs> is messed up, I don't know. Um, and you essentially get these thick, sticky mucus secretions. And when you have such thick mucus, you're at a higher risk of lung infections, um, like pneumonia, uh, COPD, bronchiectasis, there's a bunch of different ways it manifests and there's a lot of complications for it. Uh, do I have another? Yep. Yeah, okay. So your clinical signs and symptoms will be systemic. You're looking for this during childhood in, in newborns who just have a low birth weight, who maybe their meconium is an indicator of it, uh, which is the first time they pass stool. Uh, you've got your sweat test and your heel prick test, which are your main diagnostic diagnostic factors, which they do for um, or children. Um, what else? You get, yeah. So it's one of the few conditions where you'll see clubbing and chronic hypoxia because you're, you're, there's respiratory insufficiency, your lungs aren't working as well as they should. And you also have an expiratory wheeze. 
because of all that thick mucus buildup. Um, there's a bunch of different treatment use. It's very multidisciplinary. So um, based on symptoms, you might need some physiotherapy, some bronchodilators, different nutrition, because uh, your pancreas is, is a big part in, plays a big role in digesting. So there would be issues. So you might need a high calorie diet. Uh, and in, worst, in the worst cases, you might need a lung transplant. All right, pancreas tumor. Um, I think it's one of the last conditions. It's a tumor, so it's cancer and it manifests in the apex of your lung. So your major risk factors, you got your smoking, a bunch of different carcinogens, asbestos. Um, and you mainly wanna focus on the clinical signs and symptoms of this. So main thing is Horner syndrome. So where the tumor manifests in the apex of the lung is near the sympathetic uh, trunk on each side of the spinal cord. So what you get is it presses on the sympathetic trunk of the, the ganglion of the sympathetic nervous system and it disrupts all your sympathetic supply to your head. So it may, it's mainly made of three things, your meiosis, ptosis, and hydrosis. So meiosis is a constricted pupil. So your sympathetic nervous system dilates your pupils, your fight and flight response. So when that's disrupted, your pupils constrict. Ptosis is partial drooping of the upper eyelid. You'll talk about this in head and neck, but there's a specific muscle in your upper eyelid that is controlled by the sympathetic nervous system. So when that's gone, it droops and sweating is mainly uh, mediated by the sympathetic nervous system. So when that's disrupted, you just don't have any um, sweating or anhydrosis. There's a bunch of different signs, positive Pemberton sign. When you raise your hand, there's SBC obstruction and you get red in your face, brachial, brachial plexus damage. So if you think about the location anatomy wise at the top of your lungs, that's near the bottom uh, roots of your brachial plexus. So you're thinking your T1. And if you remember the, the lower part of the brachial plexus is the more distal um, part of your upper limb. So you have atrophy of your intrinsic hand muscles, you have weakness, which can be really weird because someone can present with that and you, 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 wanna, you wouldn't even think of the lung because you're thinking mainly of the hand, but that's a connection there. Um, hoarseness of voice because of the recurrent laryngeal nerve. And like other cancers, you also have your systemic symptoms, your fever, weight loss, night sweats, um, Etc. And I believe that is all. If we have any questions, let me just check the chat. Yep, COPD neutrophils. Thanks, David. Okay, lung collapse and pneumothorax. Honestly, I didn't understand this too well. Um, but pneumothorax, lung collapse, I think, is mainly so. Mainly, you want to know about your tracheal deviation as the difference in those. But pneumothorax is primarily caused by air entering the pleural cavity. So it's a very specific type of lung collapse, but atelectasis or lung collapse can be caused by a myriad of reasons. And faculty doesn't really touch upon that in year two. Um, but yeah, you wanna know pneumothorax is that change in, in the pressure between your pleural cavity, the rest of your lung and the atmosphere. And the meniscus sign, um, it's, I can share my screen once again. It's essentially, um, in a massive pleural effusion, you have this, if you remember in like high school chemistry, when you'd look at a test tube, they, there would be a dip uh, and that we'd call that the meniscus. And when an effusion develops this big, you have this curved line at the top of the effusion, the border between the effusion and the rest of the lung. Um, and that's your meniscus sign, which is essentially where your visceral pleura is. All right, and that's Thanks about so That was really great. I think that all the high yield conditions was really good. I also don't know what stony is supposed to sound like, but thanks so much. <laughs> yeah. No worries. See you guys. Yeah. See you fair. I think you're up next. So they have an event at 1230. So I think yeah, I'll um, make it quick. I'll make it super quick. Um yeah, so. you want me to share the screen? Yeah, so you can control the pace. I find that's pretty okay. Easy. Yeah. So basically I'm going to talk about evidence-based medicine. And um I'm going to make it very quick because this week is pretty much just introduction, but there are a few things you do need to know. So um, first off, why? Um, so what is evidence-based medicine and why we need to know it? So the definition of evidence-based medicine is, oh, let me, let me present, okay. Yeah, so it's 
well, it's here. So basically, it's like the use of best uh, best evidence available to make clinical decisions. So the end goal of it is to basically um, in, like make uh, better clinical decisions for patients. And why we need to use it is um, that right now we are, um, as medical students, I think we're kind of really early in our um, medical or clinical career. Um, so like everything we learn, we feel like maybe it's a kind of like black and white, right? So like, also like what's the clinical presentation of asthma or like how do you treat um, a, a heart failure and things like that. So we feel like we just learned the thing and like we just, that that's quite straightforward. But actually when you see real patients, uh, patients are quite complex and they might have comorbidities. They might have their own values and concerns. They might have kind of different sort of um, say they might have an allergy or they might have um, kind of compl some complications that uh, cause them to not be able to use um, certain treatments. And dealing with those complicated patients, you need to kind of really think about um, kind of, it's not just, I feel like this is better. I just think it's better. So let's just give it to the patient. But well, we need evidence to back, uh, back up our decisions. And so there are three principles to evidence-based medicine. So we have clinical expertise, patient values, and best evidence. So if you look at the, um, is it called Venn diagram? Yeah, if you look at the diagram on this slide. So you'll see this quite a lot in your, um, you'll see it in your lecture slides as well. So you, didn't, you do need to remember these three principles. So we're gonna look at each of these principles separately. So we're gonna look at clinical expertise first. So what that is, is basically your clinical skills, um, your clinical experience. So that will enable you to determine whether the evidence you find apply to your patient and how you apply the evidence. So um, an important resource um, for your clinical uh, decision-making is um, clinical, gu clinical guidelines. So those are documents developed by experts based on current evidence to assist doctors to make decisions uh, like uh, decide to decide what is kind of appropriate um, for different patients. So you can find these clinical guidelines. Um, yeah, I'm sure. So I feel like right now it's not too relevant to us, but in clinical practice, they will become quite important. And also it is helpful for um, doctors from different health services to kind of standardize their care. So it's not like, oh, like this hospital, like they usually do this thing, but like I, if the patient moves to a different hospital, like they kind of do a different thing, um, it is kind of standard, standardized across the sector. And um, there are a few kind of, in the clinical space, there are a few kind of health regulators that we need to know. So I think we've all heard of APRA, which is um, the regulatory body that is in charge of professional standards, registrations, accreditations, and compliance of health professionals. So that's where kind of, you register yourself when you, kind of, hopefully, when we become a doctor, hopefully. And TGA, which I hope we've all heard of as well, so the Therapeutic Goods Administration. So that's the people that regulate the kind of um, regulate the therapeutic goods by like medications, like medical devices, and things like that. And so they are part of the Department of Health. And um, another thing we need to know is um, the difference between so like the the products that's entered into the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. So we have listed products and registered products. So if something is listed, that means it is evaluated for quality and safety. So that means it is safe for people to take. Uh, but if something is registered, that means it's not only safe and of good quality, and it's also effective. So that means if it's registered, so it's evaluated for that it, it does what it say it does. So if it's say uh, like a health product that says it um, improves someone's um, I don't know, uh, mood, then if it's registered, that means it actually does improve, improve the person's mood. So um, that's something we need to know. And the second thing, uh, was the second principle of evidence-based medicine is patient values. So that's basically pre uh, patients' preferences, concerns, and expectations, um, such as some people might be concerned about 
the cost. Some people might be concerned about the side effects. Um, so the reason why this is part of evidence-based medicine is, again, evidence-based medicine is something that helps us to make clinical decisions. And there's no, like, there's no use to kind of look for a lot of evidence and say, hey, this is the best um, if the patient doesn't want the treatment. So the patient's value uh, would uh, definitely be part of um, evidence-based medicine when we consider kind of what treatment to give. And also when you're kind of in clinical practice, you will be kind of um, expected to answer patient's questions. For example, like right now placement, like on the ward rounds, you'll often kind of hear patients ask the doctors like, oh, hey, when can I go home? Or um, why am I, like, why am I taking this medication? Like, I wasn't taking it before. And like, you will have to kind of explain your reasoning, um, not just kind of tell the patient, oh, because it's, it's just better. <laughs> um, so that's that. And our third and last principle is best evidence. So that is, so when we say evidence, it basically means um, research. So like what research shows. Um, so it refers to clinically relevant research from either like basic sciences, like kind of um, um, say like things that are done in the lab or patient-centered clinical research. So that's, that means kind of clinical trials that involves um, people, involves like actual patients. And research evidence is really up, rapidly updated. So if you think about how many papers that's published um, each week or even each day. So like one challenge of um, using research evidence in evidence-based medicine is it is really difficult to keep up keep up with all the evidence. So that's when clinical guidelines coming helpful because basically that's when kind of people just um, find evidence for you and put it in, in a, like a document or a guideline form and say, um, in this situation, do this, which is pretty helpful. And this is the, um, the pyramid of like, um, so called, I think it's the pyramid of like best evidence, something like that. Um, you will see this quite often as well. So this lists different sort of uh, research studies and different types of evidence. And it's kind of ranked in its um, basically credibility. Um, and you don't have to know too much about this this week, but you're going to, um, throughout this semester, you're going to um, be taught about different um, different types of research studies and you'll be expected to know how they work. Um, and yeah, basically just the overview. So you have kind of at the bottom, you have like um, lab studies that haven't been, um, that haven't been trialed on humans. Um, you have like case reports or case series. So that's basically kind of if you see one patient and this patient, for example, if they present with something and you can write it up and say, oh, um, today I saw a patient that has this condition and with a, like an atypical presentation, um, something like that. But because it is only one person or like a few people, um, it is not the most, um, it is not the best evidence. And if you go up uh, the pyramid, you have case control studies and cohort studies. So those are kind of uh, observational studies, which means you have like a group of patients or you have like two groups of patients. You kind of look at them, but you don't do anything. But random, randomized controlled trials are when you, yeah, I think that's when you could do something. So you have like two, you have two groups of patients and you give one group of patients a treatment and you just like, um, because this is just an overview so that you give one group of patients a treatment, you give another group of patients uh, a placebo, or you give them nothing and you see kind of um, how they progress and that will, that was, that would be like the best way for you to see whether your treatment is effective. And at the top of um, the pyramid, you have meta-analysis, systematic review. So like that's when you kind of, when people review the results of like many randomized, randomized controlled trials. So that's basically kind of um, one step up because that would be kind of, uh, um, they will be looking at kind of, um, they'll be looking at like a bigger pool of studies and a bigger pool of like patients. And yeah, but you don't have to know too much about it this week, but you do have to know it by the end of semester. And also there's also like a preview. So the five A's uh, of EBN, which is the five steps to like apply, to use evidence-based medicine. So you have like, you need to ask a, a question first. 
and then you go like access, which is you go and find the best available evidence. You um, critically appraise the evidence and you um, apply this evidence. You use um, this information and put it into practice. And at the end, you can evaluate your outcomes, say like if it worked, if it didn't work, or kind of so I would I did what I did well, what I didn't do well, and things like that. Um, again, you're going to look at each of these steps um, throughout this semester, but you don't have to know too much about it this week, but you do have to know it by the end of semester. All right, so this is it. I said I was gonna make it quick, and that was quick. <laughs>